you kiss me and the world around is shattered how little it matters how little we know great song isn't it anyhow liz right about here after the chorus i, I go into the routine on anti-intelligence you know and how wonderful the world would be if we knew just a little less. <laughs> and then I look at the audience and I say, now, don't get me wrong, I'm not knocking intelligence. <laughs> I uh, just don't happen to go for it myself. I mean, nobody laughs at intelligence, which is the reason why I didn't line up when they were passing the stuff out. <laughs> I'd rather be a dummy. <laughs> no, I mean it, people laugh, people laugh at mistakes. They laugh at ignorance. You take the great story about the boy from the deep south who'd never seen over a three-story building in all of his lifetime, a story based upon a fellow being ignorant of big city life. So he gets to Chicago visiting a relative, walking up and down the streets, viewing the magnificent architectural structures. He finally gets a stiff neck from looking up and decides to look down, and beginner's luck, he spots in the gutter some folding money and some change lying there unattended. So he bends down and attends it. <laughs> he picks it up and counts it out. He has found $8.34, and he says, man, that's all the money. After that, there ain't no more. That's a fun It's $8.34. With all this money, I ain't gonna walk. I'm gonna take one of them yellow jobs. <laughs> so he had a long ride in a streetcar. And that evening, Relating the day's experience to his relative, he said, man, I never did see so many smart people in one town all my life. You sure got the intelligent folks in Chicago. You know that conductor man knowed everybody by name? He hollered Harrison, Mr. Harrison got up and got up. <laughs> he hollered Van Buren, Mr. Van Buren. <laughs> he hollered a mess of names, Adams, up and got off, Jackson, he got off. Then he hollered, Monroe, and I said, hold the phone, that's me. <laughs> so I got up and got off. I no sooner put one foot down on the pavement when a big car pulled up and fella stuck his head out the window, looked smack at me, and I said, is this Monroe? I said, yes, sir, this is Monroe. He said, we're looking for 834, so up and hands him the money. <laughs> to discover what chemical forces flow from lover to lover how little we understand what touches us that tingle that sudden explosion when two tingles intermingle who cares to define what chemistry this is who cares with your lips on mine how ignorant bliss is so long as you kiss me and the world around the shark Frogs and all. Frogs and all. It's great. Yeah, I can hardly wait for this leg to get well. I'm, I really got the itch to get back to work. Well, I don't know nothing about the itch, but you sure got the beat all right. <laughs> I consider that a great compliment. Benny, with the beat. If you guys are going to go on all night, would you please be quiet? Oh, head for the hills. The Duchess is at it again. <laughs> Honey, that, that, that's a new routine I was rehearsing. Did you hear it? Did I hear it? I bet you they heard it all the way out to Yonkers. No wonder the neighbors don't complain. What do they got to complain about it? It costs them money to hear it at the club. This way they get it for nothing. Sure, they'll <laughs> be neighbors' entertainment every night. 
Yes, I understand the whole building is sold out and there's a man running around scalping apartments. <laughs> <laughs> jokes, jokes, jokes. It's, it's just noise and that's all we ever have around this house. No wonder I don't ever dare have my friends up here. Since when? Well, my new ones. <laughs> Can't we ever have any dignified quiet around here? <laughs> dignified quiet? Now, you listen to me, young lady. A turkey leg? <laughs> to a masterpiece like that, you say, ich? Ich and double ich. It's absolutely cannibalistic. <laughs> turkey leg in the living room is what? Cannibalistic. You ever hear of a cannibal eating a turkey leg in the living room? Don't look at me, I'm no missionary. More jokes. Look, look, what's with you all of a sudden you want dignified, quiet house? All of a sudden your father is a cannibal. What is this? You, you, I'm not good enough for you? Daddy, I didn't mean that. Well, la dee da dee da We have aristocracy in the house and I didn't know it. <laughs> Hello. Who's calling? In just a moment, I'll see if a ladyship will talk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. It's uh, Sir Roger Hayton. <laughs> How could you humiliate me like that? Oh, you just... Hello, Roger. <laughs> well, I'll be ready in a few minutes. Would you mind waiting in the lobby? You'll come up. He'll pick you up at the door like a gentleman. Well, I'm not quite ready. I, I think you'd better come up. Okay, bye. Oh, Daddy, how could you embarrass me like that? That was Roger Haynes. The Roger Haynes? <laughs> the distinguished, illustrious Roger Haynes? The Roger Haynes, who every single solitary girl I know has a mad crush on, but who asked me to a dinner party at his parents' house tonight. That Roger Haynes. Oh, my goodness. Do I apologize from a sitting position, or do I kneel? <laughs> Daddy, you're always making jokes. Isn't anything serious to you? Roger's father doesn't tell jokes. You know what he does? He comes home and worries every night like a father should. <laughs> Listen, young lady, if I didn't tell jokes, I wouldn't have a home to come to, to worry or to laugh in or anything else. <laughs> Telling jokes happens to be my job. Tell her, Benny. It's his job. <laughs> yeah, it's my job, and I'm considered pretty good at it, too, as Benny can tell you. He's pretty good at it. <laughs> what do you care if I'm good at it or not? To you, I'm just a slob. He's a slob. <laughs> I'll tell you what to tell her. I couldn't help it. I got rolling. Well, Roger's father is good at his job, too. He happens to be an investment banker with a seat on the stock exchange. And he wouldn't be caught dead gnawing on a turkey leg in the living room. If he wanted a snack, he'd have his butler serve him something on a tray. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry you got stuck with an uncouth father. Daddy, you're not uncouth. It's just that... Well, Roger's parents are cu so cultured and refined, and, well, Roger's been to school abroad, and, and he speaks four languages, and, well, when he comes up here to call on me now, and, and he meets you, well, what I mean is, Daddy... What? You mean when he meets me, he'll run out screaming in the night? <laughs> Daddy, I didn't mean that. You didn't mean that? What else could you mean? You're ashamed of your father. Listen, my father was a common laborer. Never made over $40 a week in his life, but he had 10 children who looked up to him like he was president of the United States. If he had a few more kids, he could have got enough votes to be elected. <laughs> Daddy, it's not that I'm ashamed of you. It's just that... That's Roger. And I haven't done my nails yet. Oh, what'll I do? You'll do your nails. That's what you'll do. Go on up and do them. We'll take care of them. Now, Daddy, please, no jokes. Go on, go on. We'll make them feel right at home. I'll look worried. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, do you think so? I really didn't have too much time. 
Four hours. <laughs> Father, dear, I'm not just sure when we'll be home. I'd advise you not to wait up for us. I'm sure, dear. Twelve o'clock. <laughs> Good night, Father, dear. <laughs> Let's go, Roger. It was awfully nice meeting all of you. Thank you. Good night, Mr. Williams. See you again. Yes, I know you will. Twelve o'clock. <laughs> Tell that Clark Avenue playboy to get that girl in here by 12 o'clock? I know, Danny, but... Speaks four languages. You can't understand English. <laughs> Danny, would you please not fly off the handle the minute they walk through the door? Who's going to fly off the handle? You will. That's probably the principal difference between you and Roger's father. Well, now, don't you start with Roger's father. Poor guy, I, I never even met him, and I hate him already. <laughs> Danny... You know as well as I do that every child goes through the period of thinking everybody else's parents are better than hers. Now, right now, Terry thinks that her idea of the perfect father is Mr. Haynes. Why don't you try to be a little bit more like him? Have a little dignity. Dignity? Yep. That's what I need, dignity? You could use a little. <laughs> well, if it'll help, from now on, I'm gonna be filthy with dignity. <laughs> Now, listen, Danny, you can start when they come through that door. Now, listen, treat your daughter quietly, calmly. You know, so she can be proud of you. Believe me, I... I honestly, I'll, I'll be... I'll be a gentleman to her. Hey. <clears throat> Terry, dear, you're a, a, a little late, aren't you? Yes, Danny, I know, but, but the reason why... Please, sweetheart, I'm not reproving you at all, darling. It's just that when you come in later than the hour we agree upon, I worry, and it's perfectly normal for a father who loves his children to be interested in their welfare. You're absolutely right, Mr. Williams. Don't give me that. No, no. <laughs> just a minute. Just a minute. All right, just a minute. Now listen to me, kids. Let me tell you, when I... Who do you think you're soft-soaking? What do you think, like you teenagers know everything? When I was your age, I was a father. Daddy, you promised. I'm treating her like a gentleman. I didn't say him. <laughs> you, Mr. Williams, me. When I tell you, young fella... Ter Teresa, dear, you're interrupting. I'm speaking with Mr. Lee. I want her to come in at 12 o'clock. You understand? Not 12.01. I'll tell it to you in four languages. Alla dodici un punto. Do you understand? In other words, it's wolf o'clock. Do you understand? Good night, Terry. This may hurt a little. Put out your tongue. I goofed, huh? Oh, I don't know. It's nothing you can't fix by hiding out in the hills for a couple of years. <laughs> oh. Hi. Missed you at breakfast this morning. Did you sleep well last night? Good. <laughs> Look, uh, I, I, I admit I'm wrong, and I, and I, owe, I owe you an apology. What about me? <laughs> what do I owe you an apology for? I don't know. I'm too young to understand. <laughs> okay, I apologize. Now get lost. Look, honey, I'm sorry I lost my temper, but I, I was worried about you. And after all, uh, you like Roger's father, and you said yourself he goes around worrying all the time. And... But, Daddy, he worries about important things like the stock market. You're more important to me than the stock market. Daddy, I wasn't very late. I know, I know, and I embarrassed you, and I'm sorry. 
Believe me, if I didn't feel it genuinely, I wouldn't say to you, a child, I'm sorry. But I am sorry, and I apologize. Now, will you forgive me? Well, even if I forgive you, what about Roger? Oh, I took care of him. I sent him a new necktie. <laughs> Besides, I called him on the phone. You called him, really? Yeah, I talked to him, and I talked to his mother, too. And you know what else? I invited them to dinner, and they accepted. What? <laughs> you invited them here? Yeah, I invited him here. Why not? But, Daddy, they're, they're used to meeting people with culture and refinement. Well, Benny's coming. <laughs> Benny! You invited Benny? Yeah, I invited Benny. They may as well meet two slobs while they're at it. <laughs> I take back the apology. You think this house is a pigsty? It's not good enough for them? Well, it's okay with me. Just forget I ever came in here. <laughs> All right. I apologize. <laughs> now, what do you want me to do? Call them up and tell them not to come? Oh, Daddy, it's just that they're so proper and they do everything so right. Oh, uh, we'll do everything right, too. Believe me, it'll be a very high-class dinner party. I'll be the butler and wear a tuxedo. <laughs> You'll be in bed and wear pajamas. <laughs> now, look, don't worry. Everything will turn out fine. So. You don't have to hope so. Take your daddy's word for it. What a dinner party it's gonna be. Louise will fix a nice meal, then Benny will play the piano, I'll tell some jokes and sing. Jokes? <laughs> oh, I forgot. No singing, no jokes. Just dignity. <laughs> what a wonderful party we're gonna have. <laughs> See, the Farouks aren't here yet. Benjamin, you darling. We've been missing you at the regatta. <laughs> Sorry, I was out walking one of the butlers. We have a match set, you know. Oh. <laughs> hey, catch the get-up. Kind of an old-world Grace Kelly, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Daddy, you promised there wouldn't be any clowns. All right, guys, now cut it out. Remember what I told you. Okay, Terry, honey, don't worry. Before they come, I'm a loudmouth, brassy press agent. When they're here, perfect lady. <laughs> no jokes. <laughs> no jokes? What are we going to talk about? What do you mean, what are we going to talk about? Why do you suppose we've been studying the Wall Street Journal all day? <laughs> Is that what that was? No wonder I couldn't find the comic section. <laughs> all right, now cut it out. Now remember. We talk their language, stocks and high finances. Let them know that actors are interested in other facets of life besides the entertainment. That's them. Okay, now, okay. Now please, Just everybody. keep your shirt on, will you? Everything will be fine. Benny, let them in. No, Benny, let Louise get it. That's what we have a maid for. All right. <laughs> people in this room and nobody answered the door? Uh, I got work to do in the kitchen. I'm a cook, not an octopus. <laughs> come in, come in. Good evening. Good evening. It's so nice to see you. Thank you, dear lady. I've been looking forward to meeting you. Thank you. What a pleasure meeting you, sir. Pleasure is mine, I assure you. So I was terribly sorry to hear about your leg. Oh, those polo ponies, you know. <laughs> Highly spirited devils. <laughs> Good to see you again. How are you, Roger? <laughs> I'd like to have you meet my associate and dear friend, Miss Elizabeth O'Neill. How do you do? Miss Haynes. Do you do? And my music conductor, Mr. Benjamin Lessie. I'm so pleased to know you. I am pleased to observe that the Dow Jones industrial averages are up one and an eighth. <laughs> you're wearing. I'm... Oh, thank you. I picked it up very cheaply on the continent. Continental can, one and a half. <laughs> so sit down, Sally. Thank you very much. Well, now, do you get a chance to know each other a little better? 
It has been a very lovely day, especially for the green market. The wheat is up a nickel. And nickel is down a dime. Peculiar <laughs> how, how the stock market fluctuates, you know. I, uh, I deal with the firm of uh, Wayne uh, uh, Payne, Weber, and... Uh, uh, oh, oh, lobster. I just love lobster. Yeah, lobster. <laughs> you know, that reminds me of a very funny story I frequently tell the boys down at the bar. Uh -huh. Yes. It seems this fellow went into a restaurant and ordered lobster. Well, sir, when they brought him the lobster, uh, he found that the lobster was one claw short. Dad, you promised. <laughs> All right, Roger. Mr. Williams, my son is afraid I'm going to embarrass him. Oh? Yes, he thinks you are the world's greatest storyteller, and he thinks I am the worst. Oh, now. What Roger means, dearie. I know you... what Roger means, my dear. Well, I don't think you do, Dad. I... Well, it's just that I don't think you should... you should tell jokes to a professional like Mr. Williams. Especially that lobster story. That's one of his best. <sighs> Mr. Williams, it is incredible how all kids think their parents are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, I know that is one of Mr. Williams' best stories. Haven't I heard him tell it at the Latin Quarter in Boston, at the Shea Ferry in Chicago, and at the Chase Hotel in St. Louis? Do you go to nightclubs, Mr. Haynes? Yes, why, of course I do, especially whenever performers like your great father here appear. My husband is a great fan of yours, Mr. Williams, and I am too. Really? Uh, you bet. And even though my son thinks so, I'm not such an idiot as to attempt to compete with my favorite nightclub entertainer uh, telling stories. And by George, I didn't come here to talk about the stock market either, which incidentally is up, not down. <laughs> and it was not a lovely day for wheat, and nickel hasn't budged an inch in a week. <laughs> now then, Mr. Williams, are you going to get up and uh, do that wonderful bus trip routine for us, or are you going to sit there and force me to murder one of your greatest stories? <laughs> <laughs> I have never been paid such a compliment before at a more advantageous time. Thank you very much, and I... I'd be more than happy to tell you the bus story. Daddy, please don't do that bus routine. Hmm. Well, you see, Mr. Haynes, uh, your son is not the only one who's worried about his parent embarrassing him. My daughter is now afraid that I'm going to embarrass her. Daddy, I didn't mean that. I just don't want you to tell them the bus story. I want you to tell them the story about that girl who kept trying to bring up her father to be like everybody else. Oh, it's a real great story, and it's real funny, too. Especially the part where that silly, immature teenager kept comparing her father with everybody else's, never realizing that everyone has their own qualities and that a man can be pretty darn great in his own way without being like everybody else. Sweetheart, the, there's only one thing wrong with that story. It, it just doesn't have a surprise ending. I mean, the, the father loves his daughter very much. It, he knows she loves him, and, well, where there's that love, my, it's just the same old happy ending. That's a very funny story. <laughs> <laughs> Say, I got an idea. Why don't I do How Little We Know? I want to do that for a real live audience, anybody. Come on, let's get a couple of Let's go. That's where I do it. I don't know what I do. You can hear the whole thing. Watch everything that goes on. We just heard this tonight. Hey! Why can't we have some dignified quiet in here?